Well, good morning, folks. I can't believe it is the last Sunday of June. But God is faithful, and we are together. So that's exciting. Well, Therese is excited if nobody else is. I'm glad that we are together this morning, and we can lift our voices to the King and just extol him. That's an old word. Yeah, that's a good word. To lift him up on high and to give him the honor and the glory and the praise that he is due. Amen? So Jesus, we give you this time this morning. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are here in our midst. Thank you that you never leave us or forsake us, but you walk with us day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment. God, through every step that we take, Lord, let us always acknowledge that you are there with us through every moment and every minute. So, Jesus, today, Spirit, Father God, we thank you and we choose to give you the first fruits of our week, Lord, to set the tone, to set the atmosphere, to bring you praise and bring you glory in jesus name all the people said amen, amen. let's stand and worship the lord together
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, we just praise your name, O oh God, today. We thank you, O oh God, that we can worship you and be together, O oh God, and to lift up our voices unto you. For, Lord, you are great. You are worthy of praise and honor and glory. And, Lord, we thank you, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God. Lord, we just, Lord, lift up this service to you. Lord, may it glorify you. Lord, may the words that are spoken, may the things that are said, Lord, bring honor to you. Lord, as we look in your word, may it cause us to be more like you. Search our hearts, O oh God, today. Father, we thank you, O oh God. We praise your name, O oh God. For great is your faithfulness, O oh God. Great is your faithfulness. We praise you. We give you honor in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Well, we all survived the storm of this week. Hopefully, uh, you won't be spending too much time cleaning up, but I'm sure many of you have lots to clean up and deal with. And uh, fortunately, the, the church was pretty much uh, unscathed, other than the, a piece of soffit came off at the front of the building, and we managed to get that back. And so really, other than that, nothing happened to our building here, which was good. <coughs> And uh, considering the damage around town and around people's homes, uh, we're very thankful. And uh, I'm sure many of us will be uh, working for the next little bit to try to finish cleaning up all the mess. But uh, thankful for our hydro workers and all the people they were able to bring in to get hydro back on. And, you know, we're very thankful. We, we are. And, uh, if I, if I saw nothing else, I saw people in our community caring for one another. And uh, I left here on Wednesday night after the storm and headed home, and our road was completely blocked in, in parts, and there were all the neighbors out with chainsaws and their trucks and trying to clean it all away so that people could get down the road. And, you know, it, it's been interesting to watch as people have just gathered together and helped each other uh, during uh, what a mess it was. So... And I followed Teresa home. Yes, I did. I want to make sure she got home. Can you imagine we were sitting in the building and it was pouring outside and I'm thinking, how's Teresa going to get home? Like, she's on her scooter in this weather and it calmed down and, and cleared up enough that she got home and didn't get too wet and, you know, we're thankful. So, uh, where is Barnabas? Uh, this is a, a guy in scripture that uh, we're going to talk a little bit about today, but every year um, at this time of year, the church, I don't know how many years they've been doing it, but every, every year at graduation time, uh, the church has given an award to a high school student at Pelican Falls and at Sioux Lookout, or Sioux North. Um, and it's called the Barnabas Award. Um, the background behind it is that uh, New Life's desire to encourage individuals who take the time for new people in their midst. We, wanted to, we want to acknowledge and honor those who encourage others. Barnabas was such an individual and thus the namesake of this award. Barnabas was a contemporary of Paul the Apostle and served in the early church. He was the one who first introduced Paul as a convert to Christ to the other apostles. Barnabas later asked Paul to come and help him at the church in Antioch. Barnabas took Paul under his wing to help develop him into the leader Paul would become. Barnabas lived up to his name, and the Greek text of Acts 4.36 explains the name as the son of, of consolation or the son of encouragement. He was the one with the good words and helping hand to lift up others. So somebody in the high school would receive this award. The school chooses that student based on these criteria. First and foremost, that the nominee demonstrates the actions and behaviors of a Barnabas. They encourage others when it's easier to discourage. They are open to new people and introduce them to their current friends, and they maintain a positive outlook in life and towards others. So as a church, we, we want to encourage that kind of lifestyle 
in our young people in our community. And so every year we've given an award. It's not just a piece of paper. It is a check with, with some money. Um, we want to bless them and just thank them for being a, a, a Barnabas in our community. And uh, many times as, as, as Christians, um, we're nice to people. And sometimes we're encouraging. But sometimes we, we, we just forget to encourage people. We, we sometimes aren't always the best encouragers. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's easy to get selfish and self-focused. And so I want to just take some time today and talk a little bit about Barnabas and the fact that we're called to have that kind of mentality and attitude. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper into Barnabas. Um, he's the kind of person I hope that we would all want to be like. Um, first and foremost, uh, Barnabas came from Cyprus. Now this is interesting because he's a Jew. He's not, he's not from Cyprus in the sense of he's a native Cyprus person. I don't know what they call people in Cyprus, but he wasn't a native person in Cyprus. He, he actually was a Jew that was taken there probably during the, the, the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire. At some point, they, they scattered Jews across the empire and to kind of keep them in check. And so he ended up in Cyprus. And so he was, he was a Jew in Cyprus. He was also from the tribe of Levi, which is interesting because he was from the priesthood. And here he is in a foreign country, being a Jew, and he's a Levite. And the other thing is that his name wasn't Barnabas. His name was actually Joseph. The apostles called him Barnabas. And they called him this because of the way he was just such an encouragement to everyone else. That's what we find in Acts 3.6, right? Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostle called Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. He was such an encouragement to, to the apostles, they called him Barnabas. His name literally was changed by the apostles to be Barnabas instead of Joseph. Now you can imagine, he, he, he's living in Cyprus, he comes back to Israel, he comes back to Jerusalem, meets the apostles, and the apostles are so encour encouraged by him that they change his name. He has such an impact on the apostles that they're like, oh, we're not calling you Joseph anymore. We're going to call you Barnabas. This is a man that was committed to the call. And he was committed to the, to the body of Christ. He was so committed, we find, that, we find out that Barnabas was wealthy. He wasn't poor. He wasn't, he wasn't this poor Jew. He wasn't, he wasn't somebody who you know, was living just on, by his means. He actually had land in Cyprus. He had land in Jerusalem. He sold his land... It says he sold a field and, and he owned and, bought, and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet to further the kingdom. This is the kind of man he was. He, he wasn't just, you know, kind of committed. He was committed with everything he had. You know, he was the kind of person who would, if God said, well, go and do this, he would go and do it. It didn't matter if it, if it cost him everything. He was committed. He was committed to the call. He was committed to the, to the kingdom. He was committed to God. He was committed to the apostles so much so that he blessed them every time he was with them. And, you know, when I think about commitment, uh, one of the things that stands out in my mind is a story that happened in the, in the 50s. And you may say, well, you know, why are we going back to the 1950s? Well, in 1956, uh, there was a tragic story that broke the headlines uh, throughout the world. The tragic story was about these five men. They had gone to, the, to uh, Ecuador to uh, minister to and, and, and basically take the gospel to a group of stone-aged people living in the Amazon. These are people who had never had contact with the outside world. Anyone that did contact with them, they killed. And so these five men decided they were going to take the gospel to them. Well, what happened is all five of them were killed by these people. The people they were going to take the, the message of the gospel to, they killed them in the jungles of Ecuador. 
They, they had gone there to establish communication with a people that no one else had reached. They had gone there to take the message of the gospel, and in, in, in the process of that, they were all murdered. Now, you can imagine, that's pretty serious commitment, you know, to risk your life. Because they knew going there that anyone that had gone to this group of people from outside were already killed. I mean, it didn't matter who they were. They were all, anybody that went to, to see these people, the, these people would kill them. And they decided that they were going to go because they heard from God. They had a determination to take the gospel to some people who were without Christ. Maybe you've heard the story. Maybe you've, you've read the book. I mean, there's, there's been two books at least written uh, by Jim Elliott, the one in the middle. His wife has written two books, uh, Through the Gates of Splendor and The Shadow of the Almighty. Um, there was a movie made called uh, End of the Spear, which is a movie of the life of these men and what happened. And then there's a documentary called Beyond the Gates of Splendor. Um, these people were so committed. But what makes it incredibly crazy is that not only were there these men committed, but so were their wives. So much so that after their husbands were murdered in the jungles of Ecuador, the wives and their children went there to minister to the same people that killed their husbands. And guess what? Those people got saved. Those people encountered Jesus. And here's what they said. They said, we didn't believe the message until they were committed enough to die. And we can't believe you came, but the fact that you came tells us that Jesus loves us, that there is a God. And uh, if you watch the end of the spear and watch that, it's pretty incredible that one of, the, one of the men who was involved in killing these five men, who actually killed, I think it was, um, I want to say it was Nate, uh, saint, he, the man that killed him ended up becoming a grandfather to Nate's son. Can you imagine? The person who is, who's treating you like a grandson, the person who, who's, who's come along and actually loves you as, a, as, a, as his own child is the one that killed your father. Only grace of God could do that. Only the grace of God could allow a family to actually love those people after all that had happened. It's an incredible story, and, and if you ever get a chance to watch it, if you haven't seen it, uh, End of the Spear or Beyond the Gates of Splendor, either one, uh, both of them uh, tell the story really well and, and give you a, a real insight into, into what God can do when we're willing to be committed. Now, I don't think God's asking you to go somewhere and get killed. Hear me. Uh, but if he did, if he did ask you to go somewhere and you got killed, how would you feel? Right? If, if God said, hey, next week I want you to go to this place. No one's ever been there. Anyone that goes there gets killed. Would you go? I, I think most of us probably go, um, God, are you talking to me? Like, you know? Are, are you sure you heard that correctly, God? God, are you sure that's what you said? God, are you joking with me? But that's what happened. These men heard from God. Never saw one convert. Never saw one person come to the Lord, these five men. But their wives saw an entire village, an entire group of people, lives changed forever and serving Jesus today. Incredible story of commitment. This is the kind of commitment Pete, uh, Barnabas had. He was committed. He, he left Cyprus and came back to Israel. He left, once he heard the gospel, got saved, he, he comes back and finds the apostles and says, what can I do? Completely committed. Maybe God's not asking you to sell your land and give your life over that way. Maybe he, maybe, you know, if he did, would you be willing to say yes? The question is, are we committed to Christ or not? The other thing that Barnabas was definitely was a man of compassion. Um, I want you to think for a moment who 
Barnabas befriends. He doesn't befriend Peter. He doesn't befriend John and James and Andrew. No, he, he befriends Paul the murderer, or Saul. Right? This is the man who was killing the church. He was executing people. He was having them executed. And this is who Barnabas befriends. He, he encounters Paul, Paul gets saved, and, he, and Barnabas encounters Paul and realizes that Paul is, is, is truly saved and serving God and preaching the word, and so he befriends him. He says, you know, Saul, I'm going to be your friend. I, I'm going to be your friend because, you know what, the church is afraid of you. I mean, this is the same man that was there when Stephen was stoned to death. The Scriptures tell us in Acts that while while they brought Stephen out to stone him, they laid their coats in front of Saul while he was being stoned. I mean, this this is a serious guy for Barnabas to befriend. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Paul, Paul goes to the, or Barnabas goes to the apostles and said, this guy is re- legit. He, he's the real deal. He really is saved. This is what happened to him. He's been preaching fearlessly even though he could die now. Barnabas befriended him and then then portrayed him in front of the apostles as the godly man that, that Saul was becoming. Right? He went out of his way. He risked his life just to even take him to the apostles because the apostles wanted nothing to do with the guy. Nobody in the church wanted anything to do with, with Saul. Right? Think about it. He's having people executed. He's got, a search, you know, he's got search warrants to go and investigate churches and find people and, and have them killed. And all of a sudden he gets saved. Nobody's really believing it's true. Are you sure? Are you sure he's right? You know, maybe he's just spying out the land to figure out where the church is so he can execute some more. Barnabas believes the story and, and, and defends him to the, to the apostles. You see, he had compassion Something that, that all of us need. Compassion. What's First Peter say? It says, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Are we compassionate with others? Are we, do we show compassion? Now, I don't want you to answer this to me, but I would ask you to ask yourself this question. Have you ever had an encounter where you didn't show compassion? You actually were frustrated and, compl- and complained. Right? It's easy, right? It's easy when somebody just annoys you that you, you don't show compassion. You just kind of like go away. I'm sure that's never happened to any of you. I- I'm sure that you probably never had those moments where you, didn't, you weren't compassionate, but I know I have. I mean, hey, there's been moments where compassion is not easily come because you're so frustrated with the situation. Colossians 3, 2, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, Gentleness and patience. How many have struggled with patience in the last 18 months? How many have struggled sometimes with with being kind in the last 18 months? Right? I mean, we all probably have struggled. And, 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 and it's just human. We're human beings who struggle in our flesh. We struggle with, with showing compassion. We, sh- we struggle sometimes showing those things. And yet we're called to be people of compassion. You know, uh, this week, 
there was a bunch of things that happened, right? We had this storm, and everything was messed up in town. And, uh, you know, there was a, a plea by the hydro company. If anyone can take in our, our guys that are coming in from Thunder Bay, because we have nowhere for them to stay, because there was people displaced from the hostel, there were people displaced from the, the hotel because the roofs were damaged. And so they needed to bring in these crews to, so that we could have power, and they had to find places for them to sleep. I mean, they were sleeping in people's homes. People had to show compassion. They had to be willing to say, you know what? You know, let them come and sleep. Who would you take in? Who would you care for? Who would you open your door to? The other thing that, that Barnabas was, was a man of great conviction. He was committed to the call, but he was, convi- he was, he was committed um, to, he was very, very caught up in the conviction of, 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 of walking the right way. And so he was willing to go and do the work wherever, right? And we know that he went to Antioch. Scripture tells us that he went to Antioch in, in Acts chapter 11. News of this, of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. So the church in Jerusalem, the apostles, gathered together and said, hey, why don't we send Barnabas? There's, there's a, a need in Antioch at the church in Antioch. Why don't we send somebody? So they send Barnabas. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, <clears throat> he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their heart. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit. And faith. A great number of people were brought to the Lord. To, or, yeah, were brought to the Lord. Then Antioch, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Now, this is interesting. Barnabas knew that Saul was a good preacher, he knew that Saul could help him in Antioch. So what's he go? He goes to Tarsus and gets Saul and pleads with him. And, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church, taught great numbers of people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So the term Christian, the first time it was used, was here in Antioch with, with Barnabas and Paul, or Saul. They were together. They, they'd gone there and, and, and you know, he, he, he didn't hesitate when the apostles said, hey, can you go to Antioch? What did he do? He went. And not only was he so convinced that these people were serving God that, and that they needed God, that he went and found Paul, went and got Paul to come with them or Saul to come with them so that it, they would, he would have some help. <coughs> Pastor Steve, can you give me a glass of water? My throat's a little dry this morning. You see, one of the things that uh, is interesting is that Barnabas was not, um, he was not a lone gun. He wasn't this, you know, he wasn't somebody who just thought, well, I, I don't need anybody, I don't need any help, I don't need, I don't need to do this by myself. Uh, you know, we live in a world... Um, especially here in, in uh, thank you, Pastor Steve. Uh, here in um, the north, uh, we tend to be somewhat independent. Is that fair to say? Uh, I had a conversation with my neighbor yesterday, and he was saying, "Yeah," he says, "You know, we're independent. It's part of why we live here." We're not quick to ask for help. Well, I'll get it done. I'll do it. And it's not just a man thing, though it is partially that. As men, we, we don't always want to ask for help. But it is something in the North. You, you, you tend to be independent because, hey, sometimes you're stuck. You have to do it yourself. If you can't do it, then, you know, 
But Barnabas was a guy who, was, who believed that he was better together than he was apart. He, he, he trusted the apostles. He, he, he trusted Saul. He, he didn't want to do this thing in Antioch by himself, so he went and found Paul, Saul and brought him back, and they worked together. He believed in camaraderie. Right? He brought Saul there. And I know I've read these scriptures already, so I'm not going to reread them. But, but it's this idea that when he got there and he realized what was going on, he went, and found, went, and went down to Tarsus and got Paul and brought him back and, and said, hey, I need your help. Come and help me. Great things happening. People are getting saved in Antioch. And, and I need your help. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Now you'll remember John Mark. This is where John Mark comes into the scene. And who brings him with them? Barnabas, right? Barnabas and Saul collect John Mark and bring them with him back to Jerusalem. This is the first encounter we see of John Mark. And, and this is the guy who's going to end up going on missions trips with, with Paul and Silas, or Paul and Barnabas. This is the guy who's going to do this trip with them. And, and he, he, you know, Barnabas believes in other people. He trusts other people. He, he, he has this camaraderie with them, and so he, he wants to see them succeed. And so he says, hey, we're going to bring John Mark with us to Jerusalem. Let's, let's bring him with us. In the very next chapter, in chapter 13, it says, when they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit set apart for them Barnabas and Saul for the work to which they had been called. So now they're back in Jerusalem, and the apostles say, hey, Barnabas and, John, uh, Barnabas and Saul, the Holy Spirit is setting you apart, so we want to send you on a missionary journey. We're going to send you out and they pray over them. So they fasted and prayed. They placed their hands on them and they sent them off. The two of them sent, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to uh, Sel Thank you. I don't know. You know, it was a place near Cyprus. And they went there and sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at uh, Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue, and John was with them as their helper. So John Mark goes with them. Barnabas and, and Saul, they, they, you know, the apostles, they pray over them, they send them out, and what do they do? They take John Mark with them. Some, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns we've preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, or John also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he deserted them in Patmos and, and had not continued with them in the work. So see, here's where we see that camaraderie of Barnabas come out. This desire to work with someone else, to, to raise up another leader, to, to walk this road. And so he, he says, well, let's... Let's take John Mark with us. And Paul's like, uh, I don't think so. And sometimes we're very quick to be this way. You know, we could be like, like Paul here. We could say, well, you know, he didn't, he didn't stay with us the last time, so why should we take him? He really didn't make it the last time, so maybe we should leave him at home. Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them. And this is the first time we see Barnabas and this attitude of camaraderie come to the surface in, in, a, in a major way because he has a disagreement with Saul or with Paul. It says that they, they had a sharp disagreement and they parted company. 
Now, this is actually a good thing. It may not seem like a good thing that they had an argument. It may not seem like a good thing because they parted company, but it actually was a good thing. Because what happened was, Barnabas then took John Mark under his wing and had John Mark go with him, and, Barnabas, or, and Paul takes uh, Saul, uh, Silas with him. So John Mark and Barnabas sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left. And they went through and were commended by the, by the brothers of grace of the Lord. They went from Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Camaraderie is more important sometimes than doing it on our own. Let me rephrase that. It's very important. We shouldn't try to do this on our own. You know, there's a reason the Scripture calls the church the body of Christ. There's a reason He calls us brothers and sisters. There's a reason that He calls us to be together. There's a reason He calls us to stand with one another. There's a reason He spreads the gifts of the, of the Spirit throughout the body so that we could all minister to one another and use the gifts to bless one another. He, there's, there's a reason God's done that. He doesn't want us to stand alone. You know, when I came here, you know, part of this church was about the fact that you're better together. We are. We are better together. Any day of the week, we're better together than apart. And, and I've been blessed. I've been blessed over the years to, to work with people who just have been incredible people to work, work with and work for. Uh, in Ajax, I, I was blessed. I had, I had a senior pastor who, who um, was my pastor for 20 years. Pastor Dave Imler. He was my pastor for 20 years. And, you know, I, I ended up the last 10 years of being there, working with him on staff and, and being a part of that church and, and being connected with, with men and women who, who were serving the Lord and wanted to see the church grow. And, and there was camaraderie with those people. And we had a great, a great time during, during those years. And then, you know, I went to Edmonton and I worked for Pastor Doug Krauss. And Pastor Doug not only became my friend, but he is my pastor. He is still my pastor. I, when I need somebody to talk to, I call him. He's, he's my friend, but he's my pastor. And uh, you may say, well, pastor, like, you know, we have other pastors here in the church. You're right, we do. Pastor Doug is still my pastor. I still let him speak into my life. I still love him, and, I, and I'm thankful for his life. Then I went to Gravenhurst, and I found what it was to work alone. I ended up being the senior pastor there in 2007. And there were no other pastors, there were no other staff, there were no other people other than the congregation. I was alone uh, in, as far as ministering with other individuals like Barnabas and Paul. And, and it was hard. I remember thinking, like, God, you've got to do something because this is tough. And, uh, and God blessed me with a friend. Unbeknown to us at the time when Steve, uh, when Pastor Steve came to the church, unbeknown to us, we would end up in Sioux Lookout together. But what happened was he came, he came through someone else. It, it wasn't like I knew him. He, he showed up at the church visiting Kirsten's sister and her brother-in-law. And, and he came to visit them. They were friends in Winnipeg. And so they came to visit for a couple summers. They came for a few weeks and and I met him, and, and you know, we, had, we had good talks, and I, I liked Steve, and it was kind of like, yeah, he's a nice guy. And, and then after the second summer, he was kind of like, you know, we got talking about 
what if you came here? And, you know, him and Bobby talked and they prayed and I, I guess God told them to come and I told them don't come because of me. Come because God's told you because if you come because of me, I might leave and you'll have to leave too or you, you'll be stuck here, or, you know, whatever. But, you know, God brought us together and we've been blessed to be friends since, I don't know, 2012. I trust him. I trust his opinion. I trust his friendship. I trust his leadership. I trust his preaching. He is not just my friend. He is my brother in the Lord. And I'm thankful for his friendship. More importantly, I'm thankful for the fact that he can stand with me. I'm thankful that he came here and was able to stand with us here. Now, when I came here four years ago, I met a young man, well, maybe not a young man. I met this guy. He's young. Yeah, he's young at heart. When I met Pastor Bob, I wasn't really sure. I'll be honest, I really wasn't sure. Because him and I, uh, the first little while I was here, I wasn't even sure he wanted me here. I wasn't even sure he liked me. And for the first probably three months, he asked me every day, are you going to fire me? And I was like, why would you think I'm going to fire you? Like, you know. But in the last four years, Pastor Bob has become my friend. He is not only my friend, but he is a co-worker who I love and care for and respect and I am thankful for. God has blessed me with two men that stand with me every day. I'm thankful. You know, I think about Barnabas and, and how he, he went and got Saul to come with him, and then he took John Mark under his wing. I was blessed to come here and, and get to know Pastor Bob and have a friend who stands with me. He speaks life into me every day. He makes me laugh. He's made me cry. He, he's made me get angry. He's made me be happy. He is my friend. And I'm thankful because, you know what? I don't know many people who understand the Word of God like Pastor Bob. He loves the Word. He loves Jesus. He is a blessing to me, and I'm thankful. And he's been a blessing to this church for 20-some-odd years, 27 years, I think it is now. He's been here a long time, and guess what? He's been a blessing to this family, and he's stood with this family. And I'm thankful to be able to call him my friend. I'm thankful to call him my friend. I, 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 you know, uh, going into a church and there's staff there, sometimes it's not always easy. I know pastors who have gone into churches where, where the staff don't want them there, and, and they've just, it's been a nightmare. But, you know, Pastor Bob from day one has, has cared for me. He loves me. I, I have no doubt that he loves me. And I, sometimes I wonder why, you know. But he, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm so thankful. Because God has allowed these men to come alongside me and for the three of us to stand together. And we're fortunate enough to have Elizabeth in the office who stands with us and who's not afraid to tell us we're wrong. She does it grace, gracefully and graciously. I mean, she's never, she's never come out and said, you know, you're a jerk. <laughs> True. There's a, a camaraderie in our staff. You know, there's, there's this camaraderie. We're standing together. You know, uh, Kevin came on, on board this last year and, and just the blessing that he is to our family. We're thankful. But the question is for us as, as individuals, are we, do we put people around us who will stand with us? Are we actually finding people who will actually tell us when we're wrong, but also stand with us when we're right and, and encourage us to, to walk right and to do the right thing? What, what's it take for someone to be good enough to hang with you?
What, what makes the choice that, that that person is okay, they can hang with you or not? You know, I came to, to Sioux Lookout, I, I had the opportunity to meet Jordy and, and Isabel and David. Um, it's good to see you guys, by the way. Glad you could be with us this morning. They're from Round Lake. And uh, I think pretty much since the first time I met Jordy, him and I have just really kind of connected, and I, and I love his friendship. And, and uh, you know, Isabel, you're a tremendous blessing to me. The gentleness of who you are. I mean, you have to put up with David and, and Jordy. I mean, you know, you, you're, you must be a pretty good woman of God to deal with them both. And David, thank you for being my friend. David and I are friends. He's my friend. I love him. Pray for him. Encourage him. You know, we, we have this ability to be like a Barnabas to other people. You see, Barnabas wasn't just, just friends with Paul because Paul was doing a great job. He befriended him, and not only befriended him, but stood for him in front of the apostles and said, he's okay. And in that process, Paul became the greatest apostle of them all. He wrote more than half the New Testament. I mean, think about that. Barnabas never wrote a book. And yet, the impact that Barnabas had on the church was greater some, in some ways than Paul because it not only caused Paul to be excelled into ministry, but it also called John, John Mark to become the man of God he was. And Silas as well, because had they not had that disagreement, had, they, had, he, had Barnabas not defended John Mark, the younger of the, of the three, if he hadn't defended John Mark with Paul, Silas never would have been on the scene. But in the process of defending John Mark and saying, you know what, he's not as bad as you think. Yeah, he's young. He made a mistake. But guess what? He's coming with me. Church, we need to have this kind of characters that, that Barnabas has had. Are we going to be committed to the call? Are we going to be committed to what God's called us to do? Are we going to be, you know, have compassion on others? Are we going to be, you know, have the conviction to actually do what God says? Or are we just going to go, well, I don't know, God. And more importantly, are we going to take somebody with us? Are we going to walk that journey together? Because honestly, I'm thankful for Pastor Steve and Pastor Bob and Elizabeth and Kevin and, and our board. But folks... We need people with us. We cannot walk this road or this journey of Christ without someone. And, and you know, I've heard people say, oh, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. You don't. You're right. You don't need to go to church to be a Christian. But you know what? You're better, uh, you're better to be a Christian when you go to church. And I'll tell you why. Because you have that camaraderie with someone else who can walk that road with you. Why walk the road alone? Why, why would anyone think that it's okay to walk the road alone when we're called to be a body and we're called to be together? Will you let those traits be in your life? Will, will you actually become the Barnabases of, of Sue Lookout? It doesn't mean you have to preach really well doesn't mean you have to preach at all. doesn't mean you have to, you know, do this or do that. It's talking about being that person who will stand with someone else, who will defend them, who will walk with them, who will help them. Now listen, that doesn't mean that Barnabas went around defending people who were wrong. Because that's another thing. Was John Mark wrong when he left? Probably. We don't know why he left. We don't even know if Paul knows why. All we know is that Barnabas said, you know what, Paul, let's not be so hard. He was young. Let's not be so harsh. Let's not, let's not go down that road. But are we going to be people who are committed and compassionate and have the conviction to do what God says and, and to walk together? Are we willing to actually stand together outside of the four walls of the building?
Will we take the time? Will we take the time to actually care for one another that we'll walk that road together? You know, I, I've, I've said this a number of times since I've been here that it's a joy to pastor here in Sulaco. It's a joy. People, people that know me who have been in ministry with me or, or been around me over the years, you know, that I'm still in contact with, they say, how are you doing? How's, how's Sue Lookout? How are you enjoying new life in Sue Lookout? And my response is always the same. You know what? It's a blessing and a joy to be here. Doesn't mean we don't have issues. Doesn't mean we don't have challenges. Doesn't mean we don't have, you know, things that happen. But it's a joy. And one of the reasons it's a joy is because we, as a family, we are standing together. You know, we're, we're standing together. We're, we're walking this road together. It hasn't been fun this last 18 months. But hopefully we're coming out of it. Next week, our capacity limit goes to 25%, which is 89 in the sanctuary, which means the kids can come in and come with everyone to the service and we don't have to send them downstairs right away. And hopefully in a few more weeks, three or four more weeks, we'll be, be past that 25% and hopefully in, in a few, we, few more weeks, some of those other restrictions will get lifted and we'll get back to somewhat of normal. But you know what? I was excited tonight, or this morning. Because we reached capacity. We're full. This is all we could have. But next week, we can have more. Next week, that limit has been raised as of Wednesday. Continue to pray for our leaders. Continue to, to pray that, you know... I'm sure when this is all over, some of them are going to want to take a few weeks' holidays and get some rest. Understand over the next month, uh, your pastors are all kind of going to be here, but kind of on holidays. Uh, Pastor Bob is taking the month of July for holidays, but he will be here on Sundays. Uh, he's still going to do children's ministry Sunday mornings. Um, on the 11th of June... Pastor Steve and I won't be here. Uh, sorry, July. Yeah, not June. July. July 11th. Uh, but Pastor uh, Jason Small, uh, the director of church plants, he was also the northern director for some time. Uh, he'll be here that Sunday morning to minister. And uh, pray that over this next month that your pastors get rest. Um, continue to pray for the family you know our family is tired tired of all the challenges and frustrations of this last 18 months and we're getting to the place where we're slowly coming out and that's good but let's pray that our family that we would just celebrate our times together that we would have a time of celebration together you know, I'd encourage you to pick up the phone and call somebody that you haven't seen and just encourage them. Pray for them. Let's just continue to remember each other. Would you stand with me this morning? And we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you this morning for New Life Assembly. Lord, I thank you for the pastors that have served this family over the years. Lord, I thank you for Pastor Bob and Margie, Lord, as they have served this family and cared for them for so many years. Thank you for the blessing they are to our family. Father, I pray as this month of July comes that you would just give Pastor Bob and Margie rest, oh God. Lord, Pastor, Pastor Margie, and, and Pastor Bob, that they would get rest. That, Lord, you would just strengthen them and renew them and encourage them this month. And, Father, I thank you for, Lord, our church family today. 
Lord, we thank you that restrictions are slowly being lifted. And Lord, we pray for them all to be gone. And Lord, in the midst of all of this, Lord, I thank you for our family that, Lord, we've stood together. I pray, Lord, that we would be people like Barnabas, men and women of encouragement, men and women that would speak life into others, that would, would stand with others and, and, uh, and hold them up and, Lord, just encourage them to walk godly lives. Father, I pray more, more so that, Lord, as we grow together, that you would just continue to pour your love into us as a family. That, Lord, we would be the body of Christ that you've called us to be. That we would be the Barnabases of this community. That, Lord, that they would sense the love and compassion and care. That we would be people that speak encouragement. May we walk together. May we have that camaraderie together, Lord, that would encourage one another to stand. And, Father, we thank you today. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. And Lord, we pray that you would just continue to speak life into us. Lord, as we listen to your spirit, we walk in your spirit. We thank you today. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon each and every home that is represented in this place today. Lord, every home that's represented by the family of new life will pour out a blessing on those homes that your spirit would be poured out, that we would see lives changed and encounter more of you. Lord, we thank you and we give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Encourage you this week, be a Barnabas to someone. Be a Barnabas to someone. God bless you. Have a great week. Uh, Next week, looking forward to seeing our kids in the sanctuary with us. Uh, God bless. Have a great week.